I'm from the land of the ice and snow with the midnight sun with a hot spring flow. No, you still can't have a loan. care man you know but I'll see you down the road a small world that's all I'm saying not, not threatening you um, help! <laughs> I'll tell you what helps okay these people help all right ACNL Newfoundland Labrador AQ PSUD Montreal Quebec Avenue B New Brunswick the Ally Center of Cape Breton Cape Breton, Blood Ties Four Direction Center in the Yukon, Hamilton AIDS Network, Kamatsi Octut Helpline, Nunavut, Manitoba Harm Reduction Network, Mom Stop the Harm, Nationwide, Prairie Harm Reduction, they're in Saskatchewan somewhere, Sunar does the whole Atlantic region, that's a big area, I hitchhiked it and it's, it's not... It's not a small neighborhood. Uh, Turning Point, Red Deer, Alberta. Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction, Yellowknife's Women's Society, which has nothing to do with an entire society somewhere in Canada filled with women. And there's not a thing wrong with that if there was. That would be a great place to get away from jerks like me. You know, uh, Women's Society, all the power to them. All the power to all these people because they're helping all the people across the country every day. And uh, you, you can help too by donating right now to these guardian angels that are saving lives and doing all this good work all this harm reduction uh, you can you can uh, what were like what, uh, what like they say uh, uh, the cost of a cup of coffee a day is that what they that's that's trademark too well you could skip your uh, your uh, bacon and egg tea biscuit and uh, donate now you know you uh, if you're anything like me, you could probably uh, afford to lose a few. But, you know, like just donate, sacrifice a couple bucks. It's going to grow back. You're employed, you're uh, pensioned, you're, you know, uh, a criminal. I don't know, you're not a criminal. I, I, I don't know why I said that. You're a good person. So help. That's what good people do. Help now, help often, and uh, help before it's too late. If I could find my wallet, I'd donate myself. I don't have a credit card, but I'm donating my time. Well, that's not entirely selfless. I have an ulterior motive. I um, I don't have uh, checks. I would uh, I would uh, find uh, some cash and give it to someone with a credit card. I don't donate now. Help. Hey, professor. Uh, Slana, I wanted to share this piece with you. Um, I'm just lost in my head. A lot. It's called crashing. It's crashing. I'm cra- <laughs> I'm crashing, why? Friends, suicidal thoughts, addiction. So what does this make of me? Some say they're only human. I feel like I cannot be free. I've been like aluminum. Influence embodies my environment. Almost surrounds my identity. I'm debating on retirement. Into an attorney with an entity. I've had so many friends throughout the years. Many dead, most lost, reality came to my fears, and now I see the cost. Suicidal thoughts plague me on a daily. My mind is held hostage dismantled. As if we're quite plainly, I'm lost and shackled. It leaves you with a sense of anger and loss. I'm sorry for my disappearance, but I couldn't hold on to a false ideology as a cross. I can't help but wonder if this is the right decision. Instead of clinging on the path that's worth thoughtful revision, I just contemplate a healthier, broader scope recognize a need for hope. I can't help but wonder what life would have been like. That's a trail I cannot know. I feel dysfunctional with my psyche because of the challenges I'm forced to undergo. The process of natural development has created new heights. I was beaten to be fearful and hesitant, but instead, what I did was got a new insight. I can't help but notice I'm crashing. I practice various forms of coping. No matter the form, I end up collapsing from silent days of hoping. 
I'm lost in my cynical young mind, a product of my environment, strongly connected to powder. It supports the idea that I'm confined. Finance is housing, religion, socio-political power. Social class, race, ethnicity, the color of skin, whatever it is inhumane, something else altogether. I am shattered glass, a dying face, demonic sin. Within this public domain that will last forever, I am not kin. Thank you. Uh, safe injection sites are helping. They are helping. Uh, they, when they released that law, that I don't know what the law is called, but um, Good Samaritan. That yes, yes. If you call nine one one and if you, that's helping. Mm -hmm. That's helping save some lives because I know a lot of people are like uh, Angry Chris. He's he's dead because people were worried about getting arrested. They didn't stay with him. And they didn't. They called and they left. Mm -hmm. Nobody kept him awake. Nobody kept him alive. And then he went down. and He died. And it's like, uh, it's, it's, so it's helping a great deal. Um, how they treat addicts in hospitals is, is a huge problem. I, the reason why my wife died was because um, they didn't see any point in taking a piece of pig skin and replacing her heart valve with it. They, uh, they said that the risk of relapse was too great to do a, a valve replacement surgery. Like, like she was a lost cause, like, uh, and like the, the way they treated her, she was in a different room every time I visited her. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and she always had complaints about, about the straight up treatment. I saw, I saw how the, the heart surgeon sat down and talked to her. He explained to her how advanced they were now with open heart surgery, that it wasn't even really open heart surgery anymore. They could go in without really cutting her open and, and stuff like that, and this, but at the same time, in the same conversation, they were denying her the surgery over and over again. She asked for a second opinion. She got the same heart surgeon to sit there and deny her again. It's uh, and it's, it again, it revolved around money. She didn't like it. The bottom line is they didn't want to spend the money to help save a life because they thought she'd be in there again, and maybe she would have been. But like, can they, they can't see the future. Maybe this. Right here was, 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 you know, her wake up call. Maybe she would have got clean.
in my experience um, in, in the recovery aspect of, of uh, you know, treatment, then let's talk about treatment, uh, addiction treatment, okay? So what I've seen as the, let's say, I, I don't want to say it's the most important tool because, you know, everybody's different, right? And one tool might work better for another one and one, but in my experience and from what I can see, the very, very important one is to learn to deal with our emotions, right? That we were suppressing and numbing for so many years. Uh, the pain we didn't want to feel, the joy we thought would be better with the, you know, substance. Um, so that is basically, you know, step one. We have to learn how to deal with our feelings um, without either running away, exploding, you know, or so all of those things. So I think feelings management is a very, very important part of the recovery process. And then the second one, right, you know, actually, I don't know how, see, that's the thing. I don't know one, two, one, two, I can't say which is most important, but honesty, wow. Like if you can't, and I think I say it second because it's easier to manage my feel. I'm talking about my experience. It's, it was easier for me to learn how to manage my feelings than to become honest right away. You know, it was easier for me to start identifying my feelings and saying, hey, you know what? I feel frustrated right now or like I'm angry or, you know, I feel pushed aside or so that was easier for me to say than for me to be brutally honest. Right. But I think that honesty is another, it, honesty is the key, actually. So after you open the door of feelings management, then you have the key, you know. So so there you go. Honesty is, um, I sort of said that backwards, because honesty is the key to open the door and then feelings management. <laughs> but anyways, the fact of the matter is that those two really, really, you know, help me get over the obstacles of like, you know, talking about stuff. So feelings management, being honest. And, and what I think is, what I don't see working and what I see, you know, the pr problem with and, and, and then maybe people just sort of like not getting it is, um, well, I don't think they, I don't think they, um, they take well to, uh, to the, uh, to the actual textbook sort of style, like, I, like, you know, the actual ateliers, they call them here in French, I, I don't know exactly the, the, um, the sessions of like, you know, reading out of a book and, and writing stuff and like they don't take that well to them, but they're just as important. But uh, those are harder to get people, you know, they, they tend to get distracted when it's like uh, 45 minutes of a group, you know, on giving information. So it's not that it doesn't work. It's just that it's not as simple for them to stay connected to that as it is for when it's like a discussion kind of thing. So. <laughs> Welcome to Char Bay's Chicken World and Restaurant Resort. This is the largest fast food entertainment complex in North America with a subterranean farm, a power plant, and the world's only magma heated chicken blast fryer. Now, you be the new senior chief night manager. Now, does that sound like what you're looking for? Well, it sounds fine to me. Yeah, you call this a sandwich? Yeah, I know. Tastes like shit. What about Tony? What about me? Get back in the kitchen and make me a real sandwich before I give you a crack in the mouth, maybe straighten out your eyes. <laughs> Surprise coming to you. <laughs> Introducing our new and amazingly tasty volcanically activated extreme dipping sauce, the shiny. They'll love it. Charmaine's Chicken World and Restaurant Resort with over 237 attractions in Mount Spalsy on Highway 272. We'll blindfold the chicken with a tiny little band-aids and then we just 
drown them in a spicy barbecue sauce and pluck all the tail feathers with a shop vac and a pair of surgical clamps. Do you mind if I ask why you do that? <laughs> Alfonso, do you mind just keeping it down a bit? The big people are talking here. And other than that, no other problems. Oh, except the toilets sometimes receive volcanic pressure blasts that explode feces all over the walls of the bathroom, I'm afraid. <laughs> pressure tank is located in room 237. So as we gotta go into room 237 and take out the volcano sauce pressure tank. Room 237? Yeah, room 237. 237. Am I not speaking clearly? You just gotta go in there and distract that big crazy chicken so me and Tony can plant the explosive. Who's Tony? Who the fuck am I? Who the fuck are you, you green ass piece of shit? Torrance, hello! How are you? Okay, would you like to try the new experimental sauce, the shiny volcano sauce? I'm awfully glad you asked me that, Lloyd. Well done, okay, listen up. We have a spicy, a super spicy, tasty spicy. We have a super shiny spicy, and we have a super duper shiny spicy suicide sauce! Hey! It has the essence of a real legendary <laughs> volcano right into the inside of the red drum! Sorry, I meant burger. I'm dyslexic, didn't I tell ya? <laughs> okay, check <laughs> Ever since we've moved here, you've been acting more and more like a chicken. There's too much pressure. The volcano sauce pipes is gonna blow. stigma and prejudice um, against um, these kind of marginalized communities. The biggest one um, to kind of check your um, knowledge, right? Um, because we have kind of schemas that we built um, off stereotypes that we, I, I know that consciously we think we don't believe are true, but um, they're still there. They're still part of our brain. And um, it's good to expose yourself um, to different populations to because it's really hard to keep that stereotypical you know schema that you built when you know a person that defies all of it right um so volunteering um anywhere right whether it be the food bank whether it be you know um we have like the dream center. So any like affordable housing or transitional housing um, places um, or just going out on the streets. And because it, every year we do care packages, right? Um, again, we have, I live in Alberta, so it gets insanely cold here um, as most Canada does, but um, going out on the streets, giving people, you know, and we always give them the Loxone kits um, because they're free at our pharmacy. Um, but, you know, pants, um, clothing, food, right? Anything to help them get through the winter. Um, and I think 
that's really where like that growth comes from because then you start to hear all the stories right and I've heard enough stories in my life that I will literally never complain about my life again um because now I have like a larger understanding of what's going on in society and how unacceptable it is that we allow this to happen and that there's not a lot of spotlight on it. So I do suggest just getting out into your community, whether it be volunteering through an agency or, um, you know, going through, um, going yourself, right, through your community, seeing who you can help. Um, but also contacting levels of government. Um, I am pretty persistent about this. They're very hard to get into contact with. And if they don't like what they're say, you're saying, um, they usually don't reply to you, but just keep pestering them. That's, um, I come from a place of privilege in which I was able to work myself out of addiction pretty, um, pretty easily um, in comparison to some. And I always say that, you know, that because I have this privilege, I should be using it to protect the most marginalized communities um, um, within our community, right? And that means standing up, right? These people in government that are making all these decisions are just people too. Um, and I think you know, we kind of, oh, those big organizations, but they're just big organizations of people just like you and me, right? So we need to start voicing that this is not acceptable and that we need policy to reflect a science um, and reality um, and to, you know, instead of protecting large organizations, um, protecting marginalized um, communities.
This man's life has lost its zest. For him, the kick's gone out of living. like this to anybody I liked, but a guy like you, well, who cares? So here's the deal. Hey, Dad, you know that place down by the creek? Hush, Kenny. That call, what does Ralph want? Oh, he has some kind of a harebrained scheme up his sleeve. He'll be by tonight. Oh, Phew. Ralph always manages to get you all upset. Bored stiff, you mean. And that's another thing. I've made an appointment. 1.30. Dr. Bogart. Why, though, I'll never know. Because it just isn't natural the way you've been driving around this way. After all, everybody should have something to be interested in. Doesn't bother me any. Well, it does me. I think there's something wrong with your thyroid or something. Like Fred. Well, that's the story on you. No interest at home or at the office either. Even when his boss leans on him, he rolls with the punch. Why get in a sweat over a lot of busy work? Same way with friends. Don Finney likes to talk hobbies. Hugh couldn't care less. His appointment with Dr. Bogart gives him a good excuse to leave. Physically, Hugh's okay, the doctor reports. No thyroid deficiency to slow him down. But has he been shortchanging himself on sleep? Is he depressed about anything? Has trouble developed at work or at home? The answer's no. The verdict? Boredom. Dr. Bogart's advice is for Hugh to find some all-consuming interest in life. What kind of nonsense is that? You flat can't do it. Hugh's condition may be serious. He'd better check with Dr. Jeffers over in the medical center. Not a psychiatrist. Yes, a psychiatrist. Boredom's an emotional state. Out of hand, it calls for specialized treatment. Well, maybe only, well, why make a federal case out of it? After all, what difference does it make if a man's bored? What harm can it do? Ed Vance, Hugh's boss, could answer those questions. For instance, he'd like to put Hugh in charge of the new branch office. But a job like that calls for enthusiasm and drive. Ed's afraid that Hugh just wouldn't spark the team. The Country Club Executive Committee. Hugh's nominated, but Don Finney says no. That committee job's not the place for a wet blanket. At home, too, Hugh's boredom exacts a price, in terms of his relations with Loretta, for example. By nature, Loretta's an enthusiastic person, but no enthusiasm can hold up long under Hugh's boredom. so many times. It all creates conflict in Loretta. Sometimes subconsciously she strikes out. But mostly she, she herself loses interest and enthusiasm. It's as if Hugh's boredom were contagious, as if Loretta had somehow contracted it like a virus. And for Kenny, the situation's even worse. Hugh has no time for the boy's enthusiasm.
How long will Kenny be able to stay interested in himself? Already the contagion of boredom is affecting his schoolwork. Disciplinary problems are beginning to develop also, problems that tie in closely with Kenny's boredom. Presents don't help. Neither does punishment. Ken's grades keep going down. What to do about it? What not to do comes easier. It's like with Ann Galloway down the block. She's bored, so she drinks. More and more and more she drinks. Sam Haglin across the street has a private remedy for boredom, too. He makes friends with every $10 tramp who comes along. Hey. Young Link Nagel down at the filling station gets his kicks racing the cops. Trouble is, that kind of business can get you into some pretty messy situations. And more important, it doesn't really solve the problem of boredom at all. You forget your frustrations for a moment, sure, but there's no real satisfaction. Excitement gets to be like Ann Galloway's whiskey. The kick wears off. Why do bored people do such things? Ann claims it's the monotony of housework that gets her down. She dealt satisfactorily with monotony when she had a job, though, back before she was married. Actually, her real trouble isn't monotony. It's that she grew up feeling that being a woman, a housewife, is an empty, meaningless, thankless task. Her job, on the other hand, was exciting and meaningful. But Anne's husband won't hear of her working now. The result? Inner conflict for Anne. Conflict between the demands of marriage and her personal hunger for a feeling of self-worth. Her boredom, her drinking, they're the symptoms of that conflict. Sam Haglund claims his trouble is his wife's stupidity. It bores him to distraction. But really, though, his big problem is Woodhall's, his competition across the street. So again, the issue's conflict. Reality versus Sam's picture of himself as worthy of success. But it's a conflict that Sam can't bring himself to acknowledge. The end result, boredom. But it's boredom for which he's found a remedy of sorts, a boost for his ego, in a pattern of behavior that dates clear back to his teens. Sam couldn't compete then either. But there generally seemed to be some girl around to take the sting out of defeat. Link Nagel, he breaks the monotony of slum life by shooting craps. Though he doesn't know it, the roots of his boredom lie deep in hatred of authority. And yet self-preservation demands that he hold his rage under control. Hence, conflict. Hence, boredom. Where does Hugh fit into this conflict-boredom sequence? How did he develop his present pattern? The answer to those questions goes back a lot of years. When Hugh was a baby, he acted spontaneously, did just what he felt like without restriction. And then his mother began to interfere with input and outgo, telling him when to go to sleep, when to wake up, enraging him, soothing him. He learned that sidewalks are hard, stoves are hot, and even little girls can bite. Cleanliness became a virtue, so did green beans.
and obedience to orders. He learned that his mother could be shocked, shocked, shocked. And by the time he reached school age, he stammered just a little. Other kids laughed. He tried to pretend that he didn't care. He worked harder and harder in school so that he could show them that he was just as good as they were. Arithmetic seemed to come easiest for him. Later, algebra was a cinch. In geometry, he got straight A's. Not that that helped much on the dance floor. Mostly, he still spent his spare time alone. Hugh's father was his best friend. He taught him all about tools, about machinery, about hunting, about people. Especially that people with white shirts have money and people with blue shirts don't. Hugh's father hated the white shirt's prosperity. They'd created nothing, and yet workers still couldn't meet their bills. To Hugh's mother, the creation part didn't matter. To her, it was money that was important. Hugh could see her side when the time came to meet his father's funeral expenses. The loneliness was even worse. Hugh went on, though, through college, then into engineering. It was a good life out in the field, working and building the way his dad had always said he should. And then he met a girl, the girl. Only it turned out that Loretta didn't like the kind of life a construction tramp leads. When Hugh got the chance for an office job, he grabbed it. But then Loretta began to object to other things. She didn't like Hugh's friends. She didn't like his crudities, his fussing with mechanical gadgets. If Hugh put up a fight, well, there were always those headaches she had. Always seemed to come at bedtime. Not that Hugh struggled very hard. His mother had trained him too well for that. The higher Hugh rises in the firm, the more he rebels, subconsciously, against the white-shirted public relations frame of mind demanded of him. And yet his family and his financial problems tie him closer and closer to his job. It's a conflict situation. Instead of acknowledging how he feels, he hides his anger behind a bland mask of false cordiality, public relations. The people that Loretta forces him to meet socially are dull and boring. He's cut off from the field projects he loves. In the cause of clean hands, Loretta has ruled his workshop out of bounds. His relationships with Loretta have deteriorated badly. Night after night, it's the same. Too torn by internal conflict to fight, he sees himself through the eyes of his mother and Loretta. Instead of looking to his own desires, he takes it for granted his main goal in life should be to meet standards set by his wife. Mounting tension comes boredom, a symptom of that conflict between the life that Hugh leads and his basic emotional needs. In effect, boredom says, I want to do something, but I don't even dare admit it. So instead of bringing it out into the open, I'll let my attention wander. I'll develop what looks like fatigue, a supreme disinterest in what I'm supposed to do. In Hugh's case, the situation has been getting worse for years. And by now, it's dubious that he can deal with it effectively without outside help. What might he do about it? Well, he could find at least part of the answer right out in his own backyard, watching son Kenny. Ken's eager to build a tool shed, but sometimes he gets tired of it. Football offers a change of pace. Swimming, too. Bike riding. 
In other words, there's variety in Ken's interests, and change itself is a remedy for mild degrees of boredom, as well as a universal human need. If you do enough different things, there will be little chance to grow bored with any one of them. Ed Vance is another one who could teach you ways to deal with boredom, because Ed's so taken up with striving to outdo the competition that he's hardly aware of all the busy work he has to handle. His drive to win shapes his whole way of living. He makes no pretense that it doesn't. Whether he's hiring a rival's key man or just playing poker at home on Saturday night. To fight boredom, then, each of us needs to take a cold, clear look at the rules he lives by. For only thus can we resolve our conflicts. We must face our drives with utter honesty release our tensions, satisfy our inner needs. A case in point, Don Finney has a need to dominate. But people who needle you can't always be controlled. Don knows that too. So he takes out his frustrations on wood. Something that he can shape at will. Something that can't fight back. But a man's patterns are already formed. The best place to stop boredom is back in childhood, before it even starts. Interest is such a fragile thing. It dies so easily. Hugh senses that sometimes, like today. That nail that Ken bent, it brought back so many things. The day so long ago when Hugh's father showed him how to use a block to pull a nail. We help ourselves by helping others, even more when we help our children. If Hugh realized that fact emotionally, his boredom could die right here in this backyard with Kenny. But the moment passed. Hugh's pattern of conflict and of boredom was too rigid, too strong for him to break. Another crisis came that night when Ralph Collier followed up his morning phone call. Well, there it is, boy. Biggest contract our outfit's ever landed. But where do I fit in? Are you kidding? A job like this requires a real field man. Well, I came to the best I know. Ralph, do you mean, do you mean you put me in charge of this whole job? What else? Boy, for two cents I'd do it, Ralph. This is, this is a project, fella. We're ready. you please? You're not a child anymore. You have a family to think about. She's right, Ralph. You, boy, you don't know what you're saying. Why, this is the greatest challenge you've ever been offered. No go, Ralph. No go. Are you really serious? Serious, Ralph. Just chalk it up to my window. Don't bother you, I love myself up. Well, perhaps we could discuss this. Sorry, I wasted your time. Oh, Hugh, I'm so glad you didn't let him talk you into that awful job. I mean, being left here all the time with Kenny, I... Oh, dear, there are lots worse things than being a little bored. Sure, honey, sure. The day is ended, a day to plunge you even deeper into boredom. And yet there still is hope for him, for out of the day's events, a dim awareness is growing in him, a vague realization that perhaps the road he's on isn't quite the one he wants to travel. Though alone, he's no longer capable of decisive action. He still can win if he'll get proper help. All it demands of him is the first step. 
Can he bring himself to seek that help? Does he have the strength and the courage to break down the walls of fear that pen him in? Or is it too late? So late that he'll live out his years in futility and frustration. Another good man fallen prey to the creeping paralysis of boredom, tasting for himself the bitter gall of conflicts unresolved, potential unfulfilled. It depends on him, him alone. Unless he finds help soon, not just this day, but the life itself is added for him. And it be another bleak, needless tragedy of boredom at work. Oh my God. I feel like, I feel like you're just like, it's like you're literally just digging a grave, trying to dig yourself out of a grave. Um, what's the starting point? I think decriminalization is the starting point, like off the hop. Oh God, just like, I don't even know. I think you have to decriminalize. I think you have to, I mean, I guess at some point they started the methadone program. I say the word, I'm sure there's all sorts of people that are just like, think it's the biggest bullshit in the world. But I mean, something had to start somewhere where we started to recognize. So if we are going to hand the doctors the reins and they're going to be the moral fiber for all of us. Uh, yeah, I mean, but how do you tell people uh, the problem now is that people want fentanyl because that's what you know, that's what people are using. So I think that's the most difficult part. So it'd be about shifting users off of the dangerous street drugs, somehow supplementing, like getting good street drugs in. And I guess probably programming and yeah, fuck, I don't know. I mean, what are people doing? What are they doing in Vancouver? I know somebody who's like does a hydromorph program and then they have like fishing trips and stuff like creating community. Maybe we need to just everybody go horse riding and stuff. What's going to change this is that we need housing. We need appropriate housing. We need a housing that is truly going to support people and like three tiered housing. Like when you're fucked up, there's your cot on the floor. When you're getting a little more stable, here's your room. When you're like ready to bounce, here's your one, here's your bachelor, your one bedroom. You stay there, you get your get organized, whether you use or don't use, totally harm reduction. And when you're ready and you feel like you can strike out on your own, here's your fucking rent geared to income apartment. And maybe in that you get sober and get a job and blah, 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 and do everything that whoever wants you to do. And then even better, you bounce on your own, right? Like we don't have anywhere for a lot of really chaotic and unwell and unsafe drug users to live. That's why they're all living in the parks. That's why they're all living in tents. And that's a, not a group of folks that are well managed in the shelter system. We don't have the infrastructure that support that very specific community. So I think the starting points are, yeah, get rid of the stigma. Like it's so fucking boring. To housing, appropriate housing, transitional housing, graduated housing, a couple more strawn houses. A lot of people do really well at strawn house. It's a wacky place, but you know, <laughs> it takes all types. And just like getting access to treatment even if you just need to go for a couple of days and get your head sorted out, you know, just anything. Safe beds. Well, spaces, places for people to go. That might change stuff. And then maybe your neighbor will be a drug addict and he'll be a good neighbor. You don't know. Six pack on 
the dash New tires on the truck, yeah, must have been a good year See the decal on the back, monster energy, no fear Take a look in the rear view, can't see till the smoke clears There's a snake in my boot, weed all in my pipe I might have a hoot, got me feeling like Yo, I'm faded like these sunsets, cowgirls get undressed I ain't even gotta stress, I'm Will Smith, wow, wow Smoking legally, turning up just like a stampede. They see me rolling tumbleweed. All the cowgirls wanna blaze with me. Yeah, you know we smoking legally, turning up just like a stampede. Hey, the mama Sita, it's really nice to meet ya. Let's head to the cantina, drink some wine by the leader. Yo, all these other rappers, they be begging for a feature. People need to be heard uh, right now, especially with COVID. Um, but all COVID really has just raised a lot of the inequities that already existed, a lot of the issues that were already existing and now are heightened because there are less resources, there are less spaces, everything's constricted. So the issues that were there before are now like heightened and perhaps more visible um, than they had been before. But right now, there are so many people who do not have access to basic needs. There are so many people who, they're with programs being put on hold, aren't able to shower regularly, aren't able to feed themselves regularly, are dealing with chronic pain and symptoms that are not being managed and having to find a way to sustain their lives with zero supports in place. And so I think it is incredibly urgent that the conversation focuses and that the action focuses on what do we do? What do, we do? Uh, how do we get these programs that were running back up and running? How do we increase them? How do we listen to community and find a way where everyone who has a barrier to managing their day, essentially basic, basic needs, um, you know, food, shelter, funding, and the ability to, to sleep and breathe and not be uh, in pain all day. Um, how, how do we fund that? We have to. And now a special extended preview for video cassette retailers only. In a future city. It's my fucking ring. Torn apart <laughs> by gangs, drugs. Happy fucking birthday. Illicit sex and violence. Did he last the quest? Oh, stop drinking stab at me, bud. <laughs> A former Special Forces soldier tries to live the peaceful life of an evangelical minister and a family man. I know how much you like Mexican wrestling. I love you. Until one day, everything is taken from him.
He wants justice. Everything is so, uh, to any chance you guys will catch these guys? I mean, sure. There's a chance. But I don't want to get your hopes up. The streets are a battleground right now. But justice is hard to come by. Gosh darn it all the heck. You need to get out of here and do something. I'll get out of here all right. Finally fucking retire. Now, he's going to be visited by the Divine and given an offer he can't refuse. God Almighty has chosen you to clean up this town, Old Testament style. Forged in heaven. Don't need to be reloaded. What do you say? Friggin' butt for the Lord. That's my boy. That's my boy. That's the minister. Vietnam, he was an unstoppable killing machine. Decades later, he's drafted into another bloody crusade. But this time, it's personal. He's tougher than the Terminator and dies harder than Willis. You wanna buy some heroin? Who's this holier than that motherfucker? You're holier than thou! What the fuck was going on here? They were harvesting organs from mutants and street bombs! A million dollars to have a Brisbane's mutilated head! Yeah. Um. The minister! Some call him a hero. Others call him a psycho vigilante. But either way, he's cleaning up the streets. One dirty scumbag at a time. Fucking arrested and then hung. He's full blooded killer. Crime rates are at an all time low. This is one man of the cloth who shows no mercy and gives no forgiveness. You two bit mother. He's stronger than the predator. He punches faster than Sagal and kills more than Norris. Your ninja plan really went to pieces. Hands where I can see him! Well, you finally caught me. But I can't tell if you want to take me to jail or to bed. The Minister. He thinks his mission of holy justice is a righteous one, but on these streets, nothing is what it seems. Yeah, you will tell ya. Yeah. I'm a fallen angel, you fucking idiot! Oh, these? These, you ask, these? <laughs> these are fake! Yeah, that's right! I'm paid! to have your family murdered so I could use your legendary bloodlust to take over this fucking city! The Minister. He's manipulated. My God, what have I done? Betrayed. I'm the monster. And shot off a giant cliff. See you in hell, Minister. <laughs> you fucking cunt. But he's given a second chance to redeem himself before God. Oh man. Oh Lord, forgive me. For all the mass murder. The wicked were punished. They were all heathens anyway. Now, a fallen angel finally realizes that he's been friggin' around with the wrong clergyman. Huh? 
Looks like you're gonna need my fucking help. The Minister. With heart stopping action, nail biting suspense, forbidden romance, and gut wrenching violence. It's an over-the-top motion picture spectacular you won't want to miss. And I had three seconds to retirement. The Minister. The Minister. Lessons. I've only had one preference, counting my blessings, but then losing the reference. I'm back to the basics. These rappers are faceless, tasteless, no patience, ages but nameless. Mad I got attitude, we'll show them some gratitude. I'm on another latitude, my level, I'm that dude. The things you do to be cruel, twisted views, insisted you. We're always one of our grew. One day we'll meet at your tomb. I don't look back in the past, at last learn to advance. Like passing by fast, no crash, taking a chance. I'm always checking the time, hop back up on my grind. My girl Telling me it's fine, but it's burning inside. Still down the ride, I see through the lies. One of the things I sometimes get asked uh, by people who are dealing with grief or challenging times is, How can I get through this? What can I do for myself? I know I can talk to you, I know I can talk to my friends, I know I can talk to uh, a counselor, but what can I do for myself? And my little pithy way of saying for them is I tell them to halt. Just halt. Well, what do you mean, Reverend Ken? Don't do anything. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt. If any of those things are identified, you need to deal with them. If you're hungry, Go and feed yourself some good food. If you're angry, go smack a pillow. If you're lonely, reach out. If you're tired, I don't care what time of the day it is, go and have a nap. I mean, those are really simple things, but they're important. And so I guess in a way I'm saying that it's okay to love yourself the way that you would love a loved one who's going through grief or going through a challenging time. Allow yourself to look after yourself. Self-care is really important. And self-awareness is helpful. And so doing all that you can to do those things, I think are really the only way you can move through it. And the other thing is the best way to get through grief is not to go around it but is in fact to go through it. My mind is broken. My soul is broken. But I continue to be. How is it? that I continue to be. Is there something then that can be called reality? Hecuba, the Trojan women, inevitable suffering within a chasm of chaos and calamity, acting. I'm not interested in what you can do with the written word. 
I'm not interested in regurgitating the ideas of a pretentious playwright hiding behind his typewriter and ejaculating his mommy issues into a 70-page booklet. I'm interested in your humanity. I'm interested in your deep, salted, maggoty emotional wounds. Stella Adler once said, the play is not in the words. It's in you. What hurts? Did your daddy leave you? Do you think you're unlovable? Well, you probably are. I mean, look at you. Acting is about crying. It's about accessing that part of yourself that can weep openly. If I stand on a stage and I cry, and the audience cries, well, then I have simply done my job. If I stand up there and I don't cry, and they cry, wow, that's some damn fine theater. But if I stand up there and I cry, and they laugh, well, then I have failed them, not only as an actress, but as a vessel for humanity. Because that's what acting is. An attempt to ignite right here in our solar plexuses. Solar plexuses. A recognition of this meaninglessness that we find ourselves within. This is the human condition. We're all fat. is hard. It's